Hello everyone, this is Caleb Simpson, and you're watching my walkthrough for The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild for Nintendo Wii U and Switch. In the last several videos, I've been working my way around Hyrule, just unlocking all of the towers and getting some shrines along the way at iconic locations. So that being said, in the last video, we got to Akala, unlocked the tower, and made our way to the ancient tech lab. And now, real quick, I'm going to spend this video just giving you some highlights here at Akala before we continue onwards. Now, to that end, we're going to get the warp location for the nearby Great Fairy, so that, which will also allow us to upgrade our armor to a further tier. So, what we want to do is warp to the Akala Tower and then start sailing towards the east, and this will lead you to a shrine here. And just beyond that shrine is where the Great Fairy is located. Now you'll notice it's really cold up in the higher portions of Akala, so what I did is I actually just dropped down a little bit until the temperature rose so that I was fine. I could also just swap out my gear or like put on a fire weapon temporarily, and that would also give me enough heat that I would be fine. But yeah, the Dehesha Shrine is like a nice teleport point to get to the Great Fairy, but also to get to Terrytown. We haven't unlocked that yet, but once we have access to that, then this is going to be the teleport point that you're going to be using to get there. So yeah, I recommend you unlock the Shrine, but the Shrine itself too is super easy. It's just a minor test of strength, which at this point you have good enough weapons and stuff. This is no problem for you. You'll be able to quite momentarily dispose of this fellow. One of the cool things about this shrine though too, it's a really easy shrine, but the prize for it is super good. The chest here contains a giant ancient core, which there's only a few of them in the game. The rest of them can only be found for a very rare chance off of Guardian Stalkers and also Gu Guardian Sky Watchers are kind of the two main types that will drop them. But anyways, um, in chests, there's only a few of them in the entire game, so it's uh, like a very valuable thing. So the fact that we're getting it kind of early is kind of nice. Now, as long as we're in the area, there is a goodie we can grab real quick. You want to sail to the southwest, and there is a, like a chunk of rock outcropping right here. You can get on top of it, and then you can make cryonis blocks to stand on top of them. From here, you can kill the fish if you want to, but if you, most importantly, there is the second waterfall here has a chest under the water that contains a gold rupee, which is worth 300. So use Magnesia to pull it up and open that. Now, just so you know, too, by the way, this is a nice chest because this one is like early on in the game is pretty sweet. It's a big boost to your rupees, which we're going to be using here in just a little bit. Um, but however, just so you know, as far as my sharing my own personal opinion, most of the rupee chests in the game, in my opinion, are not worth it. Like a lot of them only contain 50 rupees and it's not really worth your time because I think it's way better to quickly rush to get farming locations for particular materials that you can sell instead. You will make rupees far faster if you can unlock things that give you rupees like bam, 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 really quickly. Like, for example, being able to farm gems. If you can unlock the ability to farm gems effectively and quickly, like, then what happens is you're making thousands of rupees as opposed to just making 50 rupees out of whack. It just, it's just not worth it. So if you're getting chests that are convenient that are nearby, like, sure, but generally speaking, I don't think that rupee chests are worth it for the most part. Seeing as this one is a bigger amount and it's available early and it's, like, near something that we need to purchase, it's just kind of convenient, so I think this one's kind of an exception, but most of them, for the most part, I don't think are worth your time. Now, on my way out, there is a nearby Korok that I'm going to do real quick. Um, I'm not trying to, like, go super far out of my way to get Koroks right now, I'm just kind of getting them when they're convenient and in my path. If I have to like trip over them to continue onwards, I figure I might as well get them along the way, especially the easier ones like this one. It took me no time at all. Plus, you know, I want to uh, steal these apples. So there you go. I find it funny that you can steal them after you do these bowl, bowl quests or whatever. <laughs> Continuing on, if you go to the east, there is a great fairy here, which if you have enough rupees at this point, if you've been following along with me, I've been getting a whole bunch of like you know, gold rupees and stuff along the way. So you should have quite a bit, but um, that will give you enough money to purchase one of the other great fairies. So um, you don't have to like go to this location, just generally speaking, like as long as you pay for them to upgrade them, the, the reason for upgrading all the great fairies, whatever, is to unlock the next tier of upgrades for your armor. So the, the number of upgrades you can go up to is based on the number of great fairies that you have restored. So our goal is to pay for them whenever we can. If you have one that you have access to and you have enough money, you should totally do it as soon as possible because this will allow you to make your gear that much more awesome. As with all of the great fairy fountains, you can grab regular fairies here as well as three silent princess and four enduring carrots. It's the same way at all of them. And then also all of the great fairy fountains also have a tier one ingredient of a particular type. So this one has armoranth is the one you can find here, which is a level one uh, tough ingredient. Now, of the tough ingredients, though, this is kind of garbage. It's the lowest tier, which is it's really bad. But uh, I'll probably just end up selling them or something. Like, honestly, now that I have access to armored porgies, I don't need any of the other armored ingredients at all. All the tough ingredients, the other ones are all just worthless. I will be, like, mentioning some some of the best places to farm for some of them, because I know some people really like them. I know I know sometimes people are like, oh, where can I get armoranth? Um, so I will be providing those locations for you, but just as an aside, I don't think it's really worth it, because they're just bad. Like, I don't know why you would want to do that when you can get the best stuff in the game, you know what I mean? Now that we have access to that, there's no reason to be hunting for Amaranth. But anyways, that being said, I will be showing some of the best locations to farm for those as well. 
But yeah, purchasing this Great Fairy, the second one you purchase costs 500 rupees, which if you're following along with me, you should have way more than enough for that. But you can also just sell some stuff, especially gems or cooking some good meals oh. could get you a pretty good, decent amount of rupees. I will be showing you some really good rupee farming locations here in a little while. But uh, so now that we have two fairies unlocked, you're following along with me, we can now upgrade all of our gear to two stars, which that means it'll be get even stronger. And if you can get all of a set up to two stars, then you, while wearing the entire set anyways, that's at least two stars or higher you also get an additional bonus. For the stealth set, that'll end up being increased running speed at night, which I will be showing later on in this video. Now, uh, mm. as well as an additional comment, before I came to Akala, and thus while I still only had access to one great fairy, I also upgraded my climbing gear, which is the chess piece for the climbing set. I'm just mentioning it just so that you know like what my status is. I just, I'm not gonna include all the warping around to show you when I did that or whatever, but just know that around the same point in my playthrough, I also upgraded that piece of gear. I'm just letting you know so that you're all up to date on where what my status is. Now next, as long as we're here, one of the things I like to do is I like to go along this uh, mountainside because there's often a bunch of luminous stone here. So just uh, if I ever come to this great fairy, I like to grab these real quick because I feel like that's the most valuable thing here. There's, there's a couple other like iron shrooms and stuff like that around here, but they're not really super worthwhile, like whatever. One of the things I do actually think is a little bit more valuable in this area too is actually the fire keys. I don't really see them very often. They're around Death Mountain, but they're kind of annoying. You have to go out of your way to get a whole bunch of them. Like you almost have to go to Death Mountain multiple times to get enough fire keys wings to upgrade all the stuff you need for armor. One of the things you'll notice in this recording too is it set the grass on fire, which made an updraft, which then made their fire keys wings go flying. So they went landed somewhere else. That's what I was looking up in the sky for. I was trying to see if they were still just floating in the air. Uh, but anyways, go ahead and grab those. Um, but yeah, I would say like regular keys, you can kind of ignore them for the most part, but the fire keys wings, like it's just a little bit more rare. So if you're in an area and you have some fire keys nearby, I'd recommend you kill them real quick because you want to grab their wings. So you do that with frost keys, fire keys, and electric keys. The fire and electric in particular, in my opinion, you don't really see frost keys very often in places other than like Akala and Laneru. But yeah, as long as you just kind of get some of those elemental keys, like when they're convenient, then I find that you don't really need to go hunting for them as bad. Like it's kind of like you get to the point where you need to upgrade them and you only need like five more wings. You don't need tons and tons and tons. So it just makes it a little bit nicer. So yeah, if you go out of your way to get like, uh, you know, luminous stone and elemental keys wings when it's convenient, then that works pretty good. Kind of the exception to that is, is chew jelly, actually. Those you can get just regular chew jelly and ignore all the elemental varieties entirely. So next I went over to a stable and then got my horse out of there um, just to teleport it over to this location. And then I remembered, oh yeah, I have the ancient horse gear so I can just summon my horse whenever I want by pressing down on the d-pad now. Whoops. <laughs> so I don't need to be doing this anymore. But anyways, um, that is a DLC only thing, um, but is a very handy thing to be to have. All right, so next I'm working my way west going across across Akala Wilds, and this area has a whole bunch of mushrooms of different types. You can get razor shrooms and iron shrooms and zap shrooms in particular. Um, in fact, this whole area of like uh, rock woods, North Akala Valley and Akala Wilds, there's a bunch of zap shrooms here. And an easy way to find, hunt these things down, by the way, is you can use stasis. So what you do is you just activate stasis and you don't actually like use it on an object, but you're just, you just cancel out of it with uh, one of your other buttons. But anyways, um, what this will do is it allow, it will highlight any mushrooms so you can collect them really quick. And so this is a really handy way to hunt for mushrooms, especially in this whole area because it's so wide. Like it's just so big and spread out so you can see stuff in the distance highlighted, which is really nice. Um, so anyways, just use stasis for stuff like that, really great. But yeah, this whole area is a great place to get um, mushrooms, or not necessarily a great place, it's okay. The problem is it's so spread out and the enemies here are kind of scary and stuff like that. And you don't actually need that many zap shrooms, so I don't really feel like it's an amazing place, but it is pretty good. Um, I, in fact, I want to say that the total number of zap shrooms is something crazy, like like 54 of them or something like that in this whole Akala area over here. So you can run through here and like try and dodge past the Lionel and stuff like that, but I just don't really think it's worth it. Like, in fact, like you only need 15 Zap Shrooms to upgrade the rubber armor total. That's all you need. You don't even need that many. So I'm getting them as long as we're here, as long as we're passing through. This is like the the more chill light duty spot, um, but there is some other places that are definitely safer and you can get like a m higher concentration of them faster. They're closer to shrines and stuff like that. So I don't really think this is, yeah. This is like an okay farming place overall, um, but there's much better places in the game if you're specifically wanting a whole bunch of zap shrooms. Um, there's more total here, but they're more time consuming to get. 
Anyway, you want to just continue on towards the west until eventually you reach Skull Lake. It's pretty obvious, like, you can see it on the mini-map. It's, like, very clearly, uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Anyways, you want to go ahead and go to the, uh, the left eye, I guess, left from its perspective, right from our perspective. So the right eye, the higher one, has a shrine on top of it. So you just want to sail to it, and you should have more than enough stamina for this. You could use a stamina dish if you absolutely need to. And if it's raining, just make sure you find, a, like, an overhanging somewhere, and you can go ahead and use a campfire there to change the time of day until the forecast changes so that you can get to the shrine easily. Anyways, the Zunakai shrine, there's nothing special you have to do with it. I think the challenge is just the fact that it's on a high pillar, but it's not really that hard to get to. So this will then just be a blessing, which is great. You just immediately get the thing. So I'm making a quick detour to Kakariko to do some cooking because there's some powerful buffs that will really help for this next section. In particular, I want shock resistance, I want armor, and I also want a whole bunch of health. So we can do that pretty easily. I actually already have some armored um, foods in my in my inventory right now, so I'm not worried about that one. But the other things that will help is I can get some, some health by firing up a whole bunch of hardy durians. Now, I currently do not have a lot of health, I don't have a lot of hearts, so as a result, cooking up a whole bunch of hardy durians will give me a dish that gives me at least 20 gold, golden hearts, which is amazing. So those yellow hearts will just extend my life quite a bit, which is really, really strong. Um, but yeah, so if I cook up from some of those, it's really easy to do. We can get hardy durians very easily at the top of Satori Mountain. Just a little bit to the east, there is a little patch right there, just right next to the shrine. There's a whole bunch of hardy durians. You can get like 11 of them every blood moon. Um, so it's very easy. Next, I'm get frying up some of those zap shrooms that we just collected. Now, you can get to tier 3 shock resistance, which is complete immunity to shock damage, by the way. You can get that with just 3 zap shrooms. Doesn't even take that much. This will give you a dish that lasts for 7 minutes and 30 seconds, which honestly, in my opinion, is more than long enough to deal with whatever you gotta do. If you're fighting electric enemies and you're like, oh no, you eat one of these, that's more than enough duration for you. However, if you would like to make it last a little bit longer, all you have to do is just increase that by another two zap shrooms. Just so you know, of the different electric ingredients, zap shrooms are by far the easiest to farm. They're the most plentiful, easiest to get, so definitely try to use those in general. But yeah, I'd recommend you have at least two of these dishes in your inventory because if you find yourself in an awkward situation where you're fighting electric enemies or like Lynels that, sh that are shooting shock arrows, then you can just quickly, boom, give yourself shock immunity and it's great. Um, also, in the next couple videos, we're going to be going to the Ridgeland Tower, which is a nasty area that has a bunch of shock enemies. So I'm just frying these up now so we're prepared for that. So next, there is a couple goodies we can do at this shrine at night. So you want to throw down some wood, set it on fire, and change the time of day to night. And next, you want to sail to the left eyeball, or it could be the right eyeball of the of Skull Lake if it's facing... Well, actually, I guess it could be facing down. It could be facing towards the earth, in which case we're, like, looking at the skull from behind. And then as a result, this would still be the left eye. Whatever, it's the left eye. You know what I'm talking about. Go to the left eye, and here at night, you will find Kilton if you have not discovered him yet. So Kilton is found here. You have to speak with him now in order to unlock him everywhere else in the game. So what happens is, talk with him, you have to choose his top options and tell him you adore monsters in order to gain access to his monster shop. So how this works is that he's going to disappear here in just a moment, and then from then on, you can find him at night near any of the villages in the game. So he's going to be just outside of town, just like hanging out, and you can see him in the distance. He has like a big, like, blimp balloon thing at the top of his shop so you can see him from a distance and you know exactly where he is but anyways you can go talk with him and you can buy monster related objects now these are for the most part are kind of comical goofy items that are just for fun and they're kind of cosmetic -y things so you can totally play with them if you want to in particular the most useful thing he has is monster extract which is an ingredient that you can use in cooking now this isn't necessary it doesn't actually even all that good for the most part um the most useful thing in it is it's used for one of these side quests to complete that so it is required for that but other than that there's not really like anything else super great he has otherwise he does have some masks now the masks are very situational they make you invisible to particular types of enemies and i think the most useful one is the lazal mask this makes you invisible to lazalfos and is very useful for hunting like electric lazalfos to get their um yellow lazalfos tails um, so i think that's in particular is useful especially if you're going to be near like Damo lake near dracozu lake in uh or, yeah Damo forest near dracozu lake in Farron. I think that one is like kind of a scary area because they just all surround you. They're shooting with shock arrows and stuff. It just can be really terrifying. Um, so that mask makes those all nice. Now, as a comment, if you have the DLC, Majora's Mask does the combined invisibility of all of the masks that Kilton has for sale. So the Majora's Mask is just better. 
Anyway, doing all that will unlock Kilton, so now you have access to him for the rest of the game. So now that he's unlocked, we can check that off our list. There is one more thing we can do here at the Zunakai Shrine, and that is from there you want to sail to the east, and if you look that direction at night, look up towards the sky, then a shooting star will fall and it will land nearby. This is a red one because it is part of the uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 side quest, which was like a kind of a promotional event between this game and that game, and so you have access to some armor that was available from that. Now, this is only available if you have upgraded or updated your game with Wi-Fi or whatever until you get to version 1.3.3, um, but it's a free DLC that everybody should have access to if you have internet access. So this is a um, chess piece that is just pretty mellow. It doesn't, you can't upgrade it or anything, but it does increase your swim speed. So it's a nice alternative to having the Zora set. So you can do this instead to uh, swim around, which is really nice. Um, it's very nice to get this early. So as long as we're passing by, you should totally grab this because this will make swimming a lot nicer. Um, for either fishing, I guess for now, is kind of like the most useful thing for it. Otherwise, you're going to be playing around in Farron or Lanayru could be kind of useful there. As a reminder, whenever you see fire keys, then just try to kill them real quick because we need a total of, you're doing all the armor upgrades anyways, we need a total of 49 fire keys wings in order to get all of our upgrades, which is a ton of them. So if you're just getting them when they're convenient and we're nearby, as opposed to just running right past them, then you might as well, and we just get one step closer to that goal. So up ahead is a Bokoblin encampment. Now this area, I was recommending back in the Akala Tower video that you go ahead and place an bow and arrow pin on your map because this is the best place in the game to farm for bomb arrows. There's a couple different places you can do it in the game. This one is by far the best. Um, this is an alternative to buying them. Now, whether or not which one is superior, if you once eventually you can get to the point where you can make tons and tons of rupees, and then that will eventually be faster. You can just buy bomb arrows faster. However, if you want to get them for free or you don't have access to a lot of rupees yet, then this is the best option for you. So this is pretty sweet. You can get a whole bunch of bomb arrows really great um, right here. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So what you want to do is go directly south. There is like this little um, kind of cliffy looking area. And from here, you can use some of the stone outcroppings as an, an overhang to protect your fire. I guess it doesn't actually matter that much. Anyways, the goal is to just keep using this until you can make it until it's raining, or actually make it rain on purpose. Gasp, I know. It's like total craziness, right? So the trick is that if you are in the rain, you can't use bomb arrows because the fuse can't light. However, um, if you are undercover, you can still shoot bomb arrows whenever you want. And the same thing applies to enemies. So these Bokoblins up ahead shoot bomb arrows, which is really terrifying. However, if you can get them where they're wet, so most of these guys are currently standing in the rain, then what'll happen is they cannot shoot you because they, or rather they can shoot you, it's just their bomb arrows will not light. Now, as I just explained though, if one of them is currently undercover, then they can still light their fuse and as a result, they will still shoot regular bomb arrows. Now this can be dangerous for multiple reasons. Bomb arrows are terrifying, but they can also kill some of the other guys that you want to stay alive because they're shooting the bomb arrows that you can collect. So you don't want that to happen either. So probably the best bet overall, you can like trick them into making them walk forward and stuff like that, but it's kind of awkward to make happen. So what you're better off doing is actually just killing that one Bokoblin. So the one in the back, try and kill it so that it's not shooting bomb arrows anymore. And the other ones, you can just collect all of their bomb arrows instead. Now, a couple things to know about collecting arrows in this manner is I think how it works is that each Bokoblin can shoot out two arrows at a time, I think, that are collectible like that. And then you have to collect those before they'll spawn more that you can actually pick up. Uh, the other thing to know is that each Bokoblin can only shoot out a total of 10 collectible arrows, and then after that, then all the ones that they shoot out are not collectible in it at all anymore. So, uh, what you want to do is just keep collecting them for a while, but then eventually they will just stop appearing. So after you, they start like slowing down, then what you want to do is go ahead and leave. Also, another thing to keep in mind is just the forecast in the bottom right corner of the screen, because if it stops raining all of a sudden, then the bomb arrows will become regular bomb arrows again, and they will destroy you. So just make sure you get out of here before the rain stops. Otherwise, uh, bad things can happen. Now just so you know, the damage that these guys are doing is considered straight up physical, so the thing that will reduce that is just higher armor. So if you're worried about this, especially because I don't have a lot of life, if you're like, oh no, look at that, getting kind of scared because they're bomb arrows and they're black vocal blends, which means they do even more damage and stuff. If you're worried about it, then just wear the highest armor, armor pieces that you currently have available. And then you can also increase your durability a little bit more by eating some hearty dishes to give you some golden hearts temporarily, and also by eating some armor food as well to get the armor buff and this will greatly decrease the damage you take you should probably at this point like me I should probably be only be taking like a quarter heart of damage or 
half a heart or something, like nothing. It's not gonna do anything to me at this point. So one word of warning I would say about this is just try not to get too, like, not necessarily say greedy, but like trying to squeeze every single bomb arrow out of this as you can. I was showing this first recording just to show the fact that it's slowing down. Notice that like not many bomb arrows are appearing anymore. That's because I've already collected the 10 from some of these Bokoblin, and as a result, they are not creating any more. So there is still some bomb arrows appearing, but probably it's just from one Bokoblin, so like, I'm only getting the arrows from one Bokeblin and all the rest of them are not doing it at all, which is bad. So, this is like not efficient anymore. I mean, yeah, it's great, I'm getting bomb arrows, but it would be better if I reset the area and make all of them produce bomb arrows instead. Make sense? So, ideally what I do is I leave. And how you do this is you just gotta run far enough away that you, when you look back, you see they are disappearing off the edge of your screen. So once they finally start disappearing, or you can even see them reappearing back on top of the platform, that's a good sign that the area has been reset. So once they've been reset, then their health will reset, and also all of their bomb arrows will be replenished. One of the main reasons why stalling is bad, actually, is just because of the forecast. Like, if you look at my forecast in the bottom right corner of the screen, it just changed to sunny, so I wasted some of my potential rain time, because now I reset them, but it doesn't matter, because now it's sunny and I need to go use my campfire anyways. By the way, one of the reasons why the campfire is here is because it needs to be far enough away from the enemies for it to work. There's not really a particular reason for it to be under this overhang, I guess. It still needs to be far enough away, so... Wherever you want to put it, it doesn't matter. You're not going to be using the campfire unless it's raining anyways, or unless it's not raining anyways. Unless you want to do it early, I suppose, then it still matters. Anyways, what I was saying is, you only really get good, efficient arrows for the first part of running around, right? And they reset if you get too far away. So what you want to do is, rather than waiting for it to like trickle down and get bad, What's better is actually running away early, um, ideally for halfway through the rain cycle. So if you get arrows for the first half of the rain cycle, then you run away and reset them and you come back for the second half of the rain cycle, then you will it will be better overall. Like basically, instead of getting, you know, somewhere between 40 and 50 arrows, you get a total of like 60 arrows instead is what ends up happening for the same amount of time and in some ways less effort because you're not running around anywhere near as much either. Now, in my opinion, the best places to stand for this is either like, um, kind of like a little bit further back from, or like to the west of where I am. There's some hills right there. If you kind of get pretty far away, then all the bomb arrows will land against the hill and they'll roll down, you can pick them up. And that's pretty nice. So just kind of walk back and forth kind of shallowly. And that's pretty nice. Um, another thing that's pretty cool is you can use the cryonis block. What you do is kind of hide behind it and then like jump. They'll all see you and shoot at you, but then they'll hit because now you're behind the cryonis block. They're still aiming at you. They'll shoot the cryonis block instead. And then all the bomb arrows will land in front of it, which is really cool. Um, the next area that I think is pretty cool is just like on the opposite side actually is right up against that little hill because right next to their platform is pretty good. The problem with that one is because then the bomb arrows are really close, they're not going to go flying off in any which direction. The problem with that is then the, like, they're so close and stuff that they could end up getting in an awkward position, especially the far ones, they could end up trying to inch their way closer, and then they're not in the rain anymore, and then they'll just shoot you as real bomb arrows, and it's awful. One of the things I find really sad is I wish I could just have, like, a cryonis block that's, like, further back that I could hide behind, and, like, that's not right next to their platform. If I could do that, it'd be great. I could have them all, like, in one central area, or you can make, like, a little funnel or something, and that works pretty good. Um, another thing that would be really cool is if there was some way to to possibly have uh, like something you can magnesis. Because if you could magnesis a block or whatever and just hold it in front of you as a shield, and then you just like walk towards them and you like just move your control over a little bit so they see you and put it back in front of you again. <laughs> and then just they'd all land on the ground. You set it down temporarily like in front of you where they still can't see you. They're not shooting at you for a second. You pick up all the bomb arrows and then like back up a little bit and do it again. It'd be great, but there's no real good way to do that. If you were to bring a metal thing here, the problem is as soon as you change the time of day, then that metal block would disappear. So it's, it's just sad. I suppose technically you could use amiibo for that because a lot of amiibo make metal chests when they spawn so you could use that as a shield and that would work i mean you would only have so many amiibo that make metal chests but you're probably not like farming bomb arrows for too long anyways so if you do it like four or five times, you should have way more than enough amiibo to do that if you have all the Zelda-related ones anyway. One idea I had to kind of milk my uh, rain time as much as possible was to instead use the travel medallion to reset the area rather than running away, and I thought myself very clever for this. So as a result, I just, this is DLC only, by the way, and I got it earlier on in this video, but the, deal, the travel medallion allows me to warp to it, and as a result, that will reset the area, but I'm not uh, wasting as many in-game minutes by running around instead. So I think it saves me like an hour or something of in-game time. 
So anyways, I hung out here for a little bit and I ended up with a total of 62 bomb arrows. Now, some of those, I had some before I started, I don't know how many, maybe 11 or something. So I, I was not very efficient with this. I think this was even like, uh, like the second time I've ever even done this before. I just recorded it real quick. I just like jumped right in and did it. I didn't practice it very much or anything. So as a result, um, that could probably be done more efficiently and everything, but you get the general idea. But yeah, bomb arrows are worth, um, you buy a stack of five of them for 200 rupees. So 40 rupees per bomb arrow. So every single one of those you pick up is worth 40 rupees. Now, now, granted, you can probably get them much more efficient if you just buy them, as I was saying earlier. If you get some really good farming locations for rupees, you can then buy them from shops instead, and that would overall be faster. But yeah, bomb arrows are really overpowered. In fact, um, 62 bomb arrows is enough to kill like two bosses in this game, at least. So, you know, if you think about it that way, we just won. Like, <laughs> you win. That's, that's, that's it. So continuing on towards the west, I realize this area is like in the dark or whatever, but I was suggesting you place a pin here um, earlier when I was talking about uh, the uh, Akala Tower. But anyways, um, this area is Gut Check Rock, and it's one of the best places in the game to get sun shrooms, um, the best place in the game to get sizzle friend trout, in my opinion, and you can also get a bunch of warm darners as well as fireproof lizards. Now, this is the second best place in the game to get fireproof lizards. That's probably going to be the more awkward one you're looking for as far as an ingredient, but otherwise we do need sun shrooms in order to upgrade the snow quill set eventually. But anyways, those two ingredients, so fireproof lizards and sun shrooms are kind of the most important ones here. Um, Sizzlefin trout is interesting because it's rare. You don't see them, like, anywhere, so this is one of the few places in the game where you can find them. But yeah, this is just a really good place to get all kinds of heat ingredients that give you cold resistance. So if you're looking for things for that, so if you're trying to, like, gather up ingredients before you fry up a bunch of dishes before you go to, um, you know, some of the cold areas of the game, then this is a really nice place to go. Anyway, you can hunt some of those down if you want. In particular, the fireproof lizards, I think, might be worth your time right now if you want to. Um, how you do that is just find one of them. They're along the outer edges, basically, like on the other side of the moat. They're just like chilling on the rocks there, like along the like cliff face all, on this canyon all the way around. So they're just surrounding this entire moat. So if you find one of them, take a picture of it, make it your sense of target, and then you can find the rest of them in this area pretty easily. And that should give you a whole bunch of them that you can use to get some of the fire or the flame breaker armor later on and upgrade them. So if you're looking to do that, that might be a nice time to do it as long as we're in the area and it's convenient and stuff like that. Cause we're gonna have to come back here repeatedly otherwise. So you might as well do it as long as we're here. Now, when you're done messing around, what you wanna do is use one of the nearby air geysers to get on top of the pillar that's in the center of the area. And this leads to the Gore Tor shrine. Now there's a Goron here that is guarding the shrine and he will not let you enter the shrine until you can, can complete his challenge. This is just a mini game in which you pay some rupees and then you'll start at the bottom and you have to climb your way up and uh, the collect rupees as as you go. It's super easy. All you really got to do is just ideally put on any climbing gear that you have. Also, just so you know, if you don't have the full climbing set, something else you can do to supplement your speed is use some of the speed buffs. Just so you know, the speed that you, yeah, the speed bonus you get from the speed buff applies to running, climbing, and swimming. So if you have, like, if you have, say, two of the pieces of the climbing gear, but you're missing one of them, if you have, like, a really low tier speed meal that just gives you one speed, but it lasts for, like, 13 minutes or whatever, you can consume one of those and it would boost your speed because they, the tubes buffs stack. So if you have two speed from the climbing sets that you have and then you have one speed from the buff, that would get you up to three speed just so you know. So anyways, you can mix and match your buffs and your armor until you have it. I do have all three pieces right now, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So just put that on first then talk with the guy and then you can pay the rupees to start the challenge. The specifics of which are just to collect 100 rupees as you go, just so you know. Red rupees are worth more, blue rupees are only worth five, and then green rupees are worth one. So it's pretty easy to do. Um, just basically work your way towards the red rupees is what you really want to do. You should be easily able to get enough rupees by the time you reach the top and just use the platforms to give yourself some place to rest and restore your stamina. The more stamina you have, the better. And you can also eat stamina dishes along the way if you're really worried about it. But I think, in my opinion, you have way more than enough time to do this. So don't worry about it. This is one of the funny things to realize about Breath of the Wild is like, as I keep showing you though, like you, once you have all these good farming locations for a lot of stuff, in particular stamina, you can just climb anything. It doesn't matter. Like if you fry up enough stamina dishes, then you can do anything you want. So like a great example of that is just to the, you know, just south of Wetland Stable, which is just to the right of Hyrule Field near the Rebene uh, bridge or whatever. If you go south of there, there's a little forest there. If you just run through there and grab all the hardy ingredients, hardy and enduring ingredients, you fry up all those enduring ingredients to make a dish for each one. You'll end up with like 15 enduring ingredients, which will completely restore all your green stamina, give you a little bit of yellow ones. If you just go through that forest once and fry up all those into individual dishes, and then you'd start this mini game and you just you just climb and jump the entire time, boof, 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 using tons and tons of stamina, and then you just eat one of those dishes every single time. You probably will have enough dishes to get you all the way to the top and get you the full amount of rupees without ever stopping. Like, you just win and you have like two minutes remaining. It's crazy. So like, 
I, even if you don't have a lot of stamina, even if you don't have the climbing gear, even if you don't have speed buffs, like just that one farming location gives you everything you need to do this if you want. So it's just, just kind of crazy to even wrap your mind around. So that's just how this game is. Like, once you have good farming locations, you just win. Now, that all being said, I think that's excessive. I don't think that's necessary. But yeah, if you have enough farming locations for enduring ingredients in particular, you can get like... I don't know, 30 of them in like 15 minutes. You go to Mount Satori, you go to that that forest just south of Wetland Stable, you go a couple other places, you go to like all the great fairy fountains, whatever. You end up with enough enduring ingredients, you end up with like 40 of them or something. You can make over a page of stamina ingredients just with enduring ingredients. It's not even including all the stamina, like the energizing ingredients we're getting. Just enduring ingredients alone, you have more than enough to do that, which is crazy. So anyways, um, yeah, you can just climb forever. It doesn't matter if it's raining or anything. It's, you can do whatever you want. So that all being said, if you don't have the climbing gear, you don't have speed buffs, and you're all like, oh, bummer. I don't have all these things he's talking about. Don't worry about it. Like, you, there's, there's ways you can make do easily, and you can conquer this minigame, no problem. All right, so that concludes all the stuff in Akala that we wanted to grab for now. It's just getting all the highlights really quick before we continue on with our Circuit of Hyrule now. Real quick, though, before we move on, there's one more thing that I want to do that's kind of related to all this. The fact that we have two Great Fairies unlocked now means we can upgrade our armor a little bit further. We can get it all up to two stars. So one of those in particular we can upgrade very easily is the stealth set, and we only need a couple really low tier ingredients that are really easy to get, so I'm going to go ahead and grab those real quick. We need blue nightshade and we also need sunset fireflies. The best place in the game to get sunset fireflies is here in Farron, just south of Zonai Ruins, there's an unnamed bridge here, and at night there's a ton of sunset fireflies. Now here what I ended up doing is I found some cover and I used some wood and changed the time of day to make it the next night, however this did not end up giving me um, a bunch of fireflies, I don't know why they like didn't reappear even though I've had a blood moon since then, I don't know why it didn't work. Whatever, so I did not end up getting any right there, so I just went ahead and warped back to Kakariko. This is actually, in my opinion, the second best place to get them in the entire game. As always, they're only going to be out at night. And a quick tip for you, whenever you are collecting bugs, you should totally put on the stealth outfit. I did not do that in this video, but that's uh, that would have been a smart thing for me to do. Um, in fact, with the stealth outfit on, as long as you don't, like, run run, you can kind of just walk around without having to duck at all with the stealth outfit, because you make so much less noise. So it works great. Anyways, um, these fireflies, a lot of them are kind of hovering over the water here, just on this bridge in the middle of town, but this is a pretty nice place. I don't think it's the best place or anything, but there's a pretty good concentrated amount of them, and if you just come here every once in a while and grab some fireflies, then you can get all the ones you need. But yeah, the third best place I would say overall, at least as far as what we have access to right now, would probably be like Hickley Woods, uh, which is just south of here. Um, it's pretty easy to go there. There's not really that many there, and it's just kind of okay. But if you need to get just a couple extra just to tip you over the edge, that would be a good place to go. Uh, but yeah, that definitely that bridge just south of Zanai Ruins in Farron is by far the best place. There's so many sunset fireflies there. I don't know why they weren't there this time. Maybe, maybe I should have just used the campfire a couple more times, but I'm really bummed that they weren't there. But... It's fine, I'm not upset about it or anything, it'll be okay. Now, as I was running away, I saw that torch in passing. I think most people don't even realize there is a torch here in Kakariko, but yeah, super convenient, and it's like, you know, a place that everybody has access to super easily. But anyways, um, I went, went ahead and replaced the torch I had because the one I had was almost dead. I would encourage you to do that just as a habit if you're walking past a utility item, so a torch or a sledgehammer. If you're doing that, you might as well just replace the one you have anyway, because it's kind of a pain to be out in the middle of an adventure and then, like, have your utility item break on you, and you're like, no, and you have to go find one, and, and you're trying to figure out where one is and everything thing, but yeah, it's just kind of a nice thing. But yeah, Kakariko is great because there's a sledgehammer and a torch here, and um, it's just really convenient. So as long as you're here, like, cooking or something anyway, then it's kind of a smart thing to replace it as long as you're walking through. And it is finally time to be extra sneaky. So in order to upgrade our stealth outfit to tier 2, we're going to need some more blue nightshade and some more sunset fireflies. So I got enough for all of that. I just need more blue nightshade, which is not really that hard to get. The best place in the entire game by far to get them is here in Kakariko. Just north of the shrine, there is this, like, tall plateau thing. So you want to climb to the top of it. There's a whole bunch of blue nightshade up here. And it's super convenient because... I don't know, it's like all, a lot of these stealth ingredients that we need is right here in Kakariko, right at the beginning of the game, and this is also where you buy the stealth outfit too, which I think is super convenient, like it's it's almost like some developers planned that or something. Anyways, this is definitely the best place in the game. There's a few more that's just to the right of the Great Fairy Fountain as well, so if you need just a few extra, you can get some more Blue Nightshade there. As always, whenever you're near the Great Fairy Fountain, I encourage you to grab all of the fairies and get all the Endura Carrots in particular. Those are super valuable, and I always grab the uh, Silent Princess just because I might as well. They actually, they sell like pretty decently if you fry them up, um, so you might as well. It doesn't, it's not going to hurt anything. 
But yeah, the stealth set is like really cheap. All the ingredients are really easy to get. They're all close by and it's just great. The only thing that was hindering me from being able to do it was just the fact that I didn't have access to a second great fairy at the time. But you could do that. Yeah, anyways, now that we finally have that, we can upgrade it. It's awesome. At two stars, the stealth outfit, if you wear the entire thing, you get an additional bonus now, which makes it so that you get the level two speed buff for running at night, which is pretty cool. Um, just so you know, that buff does stack with the regular speed buff. So if you have rank one speed from a speed buff that lasts for like 15 minutes or something like that, then that stacks with this and it gets you up to rank three speed. So you run very fast at night, which is really, really cool. All right, but that concludes all of the Akala stuff. So next you just want to warp over to the Kayawan Shrine to work your way towards the Woodland Tower, which I will be showing you in the next video. But yeah, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, be sure to throw a like on it, subscribe, and stay tuned for more content just like this. Remember to stay awesome, you have an amazing day, and I'll see you next time.